Well, welcome everyone. Um, we are so glad that you are here today to join us for September's Wednesday webinar. Our topic today is to help your students get ready to file the 2526 FAFSA. Um, I'm Myla Tappan, the Manager of College Access and Outreach, and with me today is Nikki Vashon, the fabulous Nikki Vashon. Um, and I'm going to be the presenter today, and Nikki's going to be watching the chat and answering questions and jumping in whenever she feels like she would like to, if I don't share something or I'm not as clear as I should be about something. This session is being recorded. Uh, I will share it with you automatically because you registered for this session. So everyone who registered will get that link. We also do put all of our webinars on our website and we're on YouTube as well. We have a YouTube channel. So anything um, like this, you always can access later if you would like. I'll also send out the, the slide deck as well. Um, I sent it out already, but I made a few tweaks to it. So I'll resend it tomorrow, um, probably. Uh, so put your questions in the chat. Nikki will be watching them. What I'll do is I will stop periodically to see what questions we have, but Nikki can also, as she knows, jump in anytime. If there's something that's unclear or she thinks that something can't wait, she's just going to jump in and, um, and let us know that. So let's go ahead and get started. So what we're going to talk about today is getting ready to file the 2526 FAFSA. So the 2526 FAFSA, as I'm guessing you have heard, um, is going to be released for everyone on December 1st. So this is why I think I'm feeling very optimistic. I think Nikki probably the same is what they're doing this year. So it was a lot of pressure for them to release the FAFSA on October 1st, which is the typical release date. And I think the reality is, is they're still not quite ready. Um, I think they've made a lot of progress during this year. We're seeing vast improvements in the FAFSA and all aspects of the FAFSA, but there are a few things that are still not done plus they need to transition over to the new year. So what they're doing is on October 1st, the FAFSA actually will become available, but to a very small group of students. So today I just read that they've identified, I think six um, large college access organizations outside of Maine, and they're gonna work with their students to start testing the FAFSA. And as they find issues, uh, they will work on those issues and get them resolved. And then they're gonna do a couple more rounds of that. And they're gonna increase the number of students in each of those beta testing um, processes. So that by December 1st, the FAFSA will be open to everyone, hopefully with all of the bugs resolved and equally important that the rest of the processes that happen after the FAFSA are all ready to go. So you may recall last year, the FAFSA was released on December 30th for about 30 minutes. Um, but what the one of the real significant challenges was, was no FAFSAs were processed until March. That will change this year. The expectation is that when students file a FAFSA, um, starting in December, that their FAFSAs will be processed within one to three days, as has typically been the case. So uh, today we're going to talk about how to get ready, but I did want to start off and just let you know, uh, especially since I asked the question, that we are feeling optimistic. This is going to be a much better year. And we do want you to share your experiences, though, um, as we work through this process together. So our official topics for today are we're going to talk about FSA IDs or creating federal student aid accounts, um, how you create one, confirm who needs one. I think a lot of people, you know, it's the same as last year, but we'll talk about that and we'll talk about the steps for parents who don't have a social security number. So we'll dive into that part of it a little bit. We're also going to talk about building a list of schools. So having your students build a list of schools to put on the FAFSA and why that is so important. I mean, there's the obvious reasons why it's important, but we want to share some resources and talk a little bit more about that. We're also going to share some resources that we have that we would love to have you share with students and families. Um, the reality is, is that the better prepared they are in these extra for two months, um, give us that opportunity for students and families to, you know, have some of these important conversations to understand the process so that when the FAFSA does become available, everyone's ready to go and knows better what to expect. Then we'll transition to talking about students who have challenging circumstances. We know that you're starting probably to get questions already from students and families about how to complete the FAFSA when their situation is not that typical average situation. And the good news is, is a lot of these challenging circumstances are already built into the FAFSA in one way or another. So we're going to walk through those just so if you have students come to you and share their challenges that you will know, OK, this is how the FAFSA is going to work for you. And then last but not least, we'll share ways that we can help. 
one of the things uh, before we dive into the FSA ID um, information specifically is we definitely want to be connected with you um, and we want your students to be connected with us. So a couple of things. If you have staffing changes, would you please let us know that? Um, if you're JMG, we do have an updated JMG list, but we do notice that sometimes there's this domino effect that happens that one school counselor will leave and go to another school and then someone from another school will take their place. And, and to be honest with you, we don't always know that that's happened. And we want to be sure that we have your correct email address, your correct contact information, um, so that we can stay in touch with you. Um, additionally, if you heard about this webinar because it was forwarded to you and you didn't receive it directly, um, in that circumstance, or if there's been a staffing change, please just reach out to me. We would love to make sure that you are on our mailing list and that you're getting this information directly from us, um, including future invitations and updates about important information related to the FAFSA. At the end, we're going to share some resources uh, for your students and parents, but one of the absolute best ways for students and parents to stay up to date is to join our email or our texting list, and they can do that at famemain.com. I'll talk more about this at the very end, but one of the challenges we have is that we don't have direct access to your students, and we know that puts a lot of burden on you, um, and so we would love to be able to connect directly with them. Um, so if you would encourage students to sign up and their parents to sign up, that would be excellent and we would really appreciate it. So with that, let's dive in to federal student aid accounts. So creating a federal student aid account or an FSA ID is the first step in filing the FAFSA process. Um, and it's more important to get this done earlier than it used to be in the past. And we're going to talk a little bit about time frame in just a moment. Those accounts are created at studentaid.gov. So one of the really nice things is that um, all of federal student aid's stuff, all of their various websites have all now been combined and they all are under this studentaid.gov umbrella. So that is the go-to location for everything from the FAFSA to loan information, uh, public service loan forgiveness, signing master promissory notes, everything lives um, under that studentaid.gov umbrella. So that is the place that you want to start for any information federal student aid related. When an individual creates an account, they're going to set up a username and password. So we refer to this as an FSA ID. So when you hear us say to a student, have you set up your FSA ID? What we really mean is have you gone to studentaid.gov and have you created your federal student aid account, part of which is providing a username and password that you will use to log in to studentaid.gov. The, an FSA ID is required to access the FAFSA. You cannot do an online FAFSA without an FSA ID, but it is also the username and password that are used for all federal student aid related processes, and it serves as a legal signature. So it is literally everything used for everything from starting the FAFSA, signing the FAFSA, whether you're the student or the parent, to if you want to borrow a, mass, uh, a federal student loan and you have to sign a master promissory note, you use your um, FSA ID to sign a note. If you're going to apply for public service loan forgiveness and you want to do any sort of applications like that related to loans, all of those require that you access certain parts of the website and you sign these forms using that FSA ID. So this is something that's going to be with students for years and years to come. So super important, and it is the first step in the process. So when people create an FSA ID, they're gonna provide identifying information. Now, people who have a social security number, typically until this last year, only people who had a social security number were able to create an FSA ID. And what happens is that with the FSA ID, there they want to be, they being the federal government, want to be sure that whoever creates the FSA ID really is who they say they are. Because now with the way that the FAFSA is structured, that FSA ID allows them to get into a FAFSA and it allows them to access and have transferred over into their FAFSA all of their federal tax data as is appropriate. So they want to be sure that whoever is using that FSA ID is truly who they say they are. So the, the um, identity, identity verification piece happens by the Social Security Administration for anyone who has a Social Security number. So therefore, when you fill out, um, you create your account, you're gonna provide your name, your student is, or you are if you're doing this process, 
provide your name, your date of birth, and your social security uh, number. All of that is matched against the Social Security Administration's database. And that match usually takes one to three days now. And so basically what they're doing is they're verifying that that information is all correct and consistent. And once they verify that information, then your FSA ID um, has additional ability to do certain things for you. And we'll talk more about that. My screen just went black, that scared me. Um, individuals will need, when they create their FSA ID, they will need a unique email address. So um, there is the requirement that an email address be associated um, with every federal student aid account, and it does have to be unique. So this has always been the case with FSA IDs. I learned it early on um, because I created an FSA ID account for my oldest son using my email address. And guess what? When I went to create one for myself, it says, hey, it's already in use. So it does have to be a unique email address. So it means that you know if families share an email address and both parents need to create an account that that they are going to have to first take a step of creating another email address. With our high school students, we want to be sure that when those students are creating um, their accounts, that they are not using their high school email address. As I mentioned a moment ago, when with this FSA ID, this isn't a one-time thing. This is not just doing a FAFSA one time. This FSA ID is going to be used for years and years to come. They have to file a FAFSA every year, and then if they borrow loans, it's how they're going to access that information. Um, so therefore, they need to have access to that email address way beyond their senior year. So we recommend that if students haven't already, that they set up a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or something like that, that they can use for the remainder of their time in high school. They can use it through college and they'll still have it available to them after college. So that's incredibly important. If you find out that a student has created an email, uh, it has created an FSA ID using their high school email address, that can be updated. Or if their email address changes, that can be updated. All of those things are possible, but best case scenario is just to create their account initially with an email address that they will have access to for years to come. Ideally, when individuals are creating their federal student aid account, they will provide a mobile phone number. It is not a requirement, but it is very, very helpful. In a moment, we're going to talk about two-step verification, um, and this is why that having that additional information is really going to be helpful. Like with the email, though, it does need to be a unique mobile phone number that's not already in the system. Now, there are in case there are some cases where phone numbers are recycled. There is a process to deal with that. So if you're in a situation where you're working with a student, they want to add their mobile phone number um, to their FSA ID and they can't because it's in use, um, reach out to us and we can we can help you navigate how to get that issue resolved. Individuals will also need to select and answer four challenge questions. Um, there's a drop down list and so they can pick them. But like most things, you want to pick things that aren't going to change. So I think th the questions are pretty much uh, straightforward. But like there is always the one like what's your what's your favorite um, TV show or what's your desired vacation location? Those things change. So we really, really prefer that people use things that are not going to change over time. So a moment ago, I just mentioned two-step verification. So two-step verification is part of the process um, when someone is creating their original federal student aid account. So when they get to the very end, so they provided their demographic information, they have gone ahead and they have um, created their username and password, um, they have answered all of their challenge questions, one of the very last steps is that they are going to go through this two-step verification, which I think we've all become really familiar with. So this is basically where in one scenario, you say, I want it via SMS or via text, and you get texted a code and you put that code into the system. So that's what two-step verification is. We're seeming to have to do it increasingly with everything that we're doing. So there are three options that exist um, with the FSA ID. You can use an authenticator app, okay? Um, we have those for work, so I have an authenticator app set up. So I, I think the best case scenario is if you can do all three of these things, that's ideal. Um, I probably, to be honest with you, most of the time use the text function. I think that's the easiest thing for me is just to have the code texted to me and to put it in. Um, or I can use my email address. So whatever email address um, is associated. Now, when you're first setting up your account and you're going through the initial two-step verification, 
you have to do each of these, okay? So when you're setting it up, if you say, I want my email address in there because I have to, I also want my mobile phone number in there because that's going to be the easiest thing for me. If you set both of those up, the first time through, you have to verify each of those. So why this is so important is sometimes we're doing events, and I know some of you are in schools that are like in concrete buildings. So sometimes it's a little bit challenging to get a text to go through or to have access to the email. So it's super important that when people are setting up two-step verification and originally creating their FSA ID accounts, that they are in a location where they can get a text and they can get their email, okay? Now, going forward, two-step verification is used every single time an FSA ID is used. So every time, Nikki and I literally go into studentaid.gov, we log into studentaid.gov sometimes every single day, multiple times. Sometimes it's a little less often, but every time we log in, we have to go through verification. But you only have to do one of the meth methods at that point in time. So like I said, I usually will use the texting option because um, it's the easiest thing for me. But I want to call the fact out that verification, two-step verification is required anytime an FSA ID is used because it does make things a little trickier, right? So I'm going to confess, as a parent myself, I always did my kids' FAFSAs. I can tell you that I should have had them do it themselves. I can tell you that I did it because for work purposes, it allowed me to walk through the process myself and grab screenshots. I have all sorts of excuses. But the bottom line is I used to do that. Well, now they're out of school, but now if I was to do that with them, th they have to be accessible to me because I might have, Noah's my youngest son, I might have Noah's FSA ID information, but he is the one that's going to get the code if we have it texted, okay? So I have to have him be in a place where he can, at a minimum, let me know what the code is. Now, federal student aid, what do they want us to do? They don't want anyone ever using anyone else's FSA ID information. Okay, that's that is the the party line, and I will tell you that that probably is the best case scenario. It's just not always realistic. So we know that there are going to be times that students are going to do things using their parents. They need to be doing it, you know, accurately, legal, you know, legally in the sense that they're not doing anything wrong. Parents are going to do the same with students sometimes, but there still is going to have to be that coordination between the students and the parents. So when Nikki and I go and we might go and we're doing um, a FAFSA session, we're helping people complete the FAFSA and the parents show up and they're ready to go and they've got the FSA ID, but their kiddos at work and can't get a text and can't get that code to them, we can't do anything. So as you're planning your work, just kind of keep that in your back of your mind because I understand why they've done it, being they the federal government, but it does make it sometimes a little bit more complicated. Nikki, I'm going to stop at the end of the FSA ID session. So if there's anything you want to add, or it doesn't look like we have questions, but just know that that will be where I'll stop next. All right. So starting last year, parents without a social security number are able to create a federal student aid account. Now, this is not working 100% yet, but we're making progress. Prior to this, um, parents who didn't have a social security number the only way they could complete a FAFSA for a student was to go in and do the FAFSA, but then they had to sign a paper signature page. Starting last year, the paper signature page went away, and everyone who needs to sign a FAFSA that's completed online needs to have an FSA ID. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, parents don't have to have a social security number for students to file the FAFSA. No, they don't. Students have to be citizens or eligible non-citizens, and they need to have, you know, a regular social security number, not one just for work purposes, but a full-blown social security number. So that is what students need to have. That's what they've always needed to have. That's what they will continue to need to have. Now, there's a few, um, a few exceptions for, for citizens of the freely associated states. I'm not going to go there today because we, we have so few of those, but if you ever have that scenario, reach out to us. But for today, let's go ahead with a scenario that students have to have a fully functioning SSN in order to be eligible for federal aid and in order to create their federal student aid account. But the parents do not. So if we have a student um, who the student themselves, let's say has come to the country and they are an eligible non-citizen, they've got their social security number, they're good to go, they can get federal student aid, even if their parents have not yet gone through that process. 
So recognizing that this scenario exists, you know, probably a significant amount, certainly in some locations in the U.S. in particular, last year they created a process where parents without an SSN could create a federal student aid account. Now, back a moment ago, when I talked about social security numbers, I mentioned that one of the things that happens when people create a federal student aid account is that their identity has to be verified. Because again, they're gonna be able to access their tax information. So there are very strict rules around who can do that. And so they don't want people whose identity has not been verified to be able to do that. Well, people who don't have a social security number can't be verified through the social security administration. So they created a different process for these parents who don't have a social. And what they decided to do um, is use TransUnion, the credit company that you are aware of, although they, they serve a whole bunch of different functions as well. Um, if that parent has a file in TransUnion and there's enough information in that file, then the parent, when completing the FSA ID process, they will see four questions that will be what we call knowledge-based questions. So have you ever, for example, um, wanted to get a copy of your tax transcript? And in order to prove that you were you, you had to answer questions like, you'd see a, a list of questions and there might be like four responses. Um, you know, did you have a car that was uh, this, of which, which make and model, right? And you'd have to identify that, oh, I did, Nissan Sentra, that's what I used to have, that's, that's me. So these are knowledge-based questions. So apparently about 50% of the parents out there without an SSN have enough information that they can be served up these transunion questions. They're gonna see four of them. They're gonna get one chance to answer them. And if they answer them all correctly, then their identity is verified and they're good to go. If there's not enough information on file with transunion, or if, so that there are no questions appear, or if questions appear, but they don't answer them correctly, then individuals will have to provide additional documentation by email. So they'll have to fill out an attest, attest, attestation form, gosh, that word is tricky, um, and some other documentation to verify that they are who they say they are. This is where things broke down last year. Well, it's one of a couple places, but it really broke down. And, and we don't have a tremendous number of parents in this situation, but we absolutely do have some parents that were challenged by this in Maine last year and will be the case this coming year. So what these individuals have to do is they have to provide this documentation and they get a case number and they get all these details. Um, but until that happens, their identity can't be verified. Currently, there's a huge backlog of people who have submitted their documentation, but it hasn't been reviewed. Um, they are saying that it's probably gonna take them till the end of this year to have um, all of those documents reviewed and to get people's identity verified. So in the meantime, um, parents who have created an FSA ID who didn't have a social security number do have an FSA ID that they can use when filing the FAFSA and providing information on their students' FAFSA, but it isn't going to be um, fully functional. And in a moment, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what I mean um, when I say that it is not fully functional. So um, what we want you to know is that when you're working with students um, and they have parents who don't have a social, you still have them go to studentaid.gov, they go to create account, they do all of the same stuff to start, except that it says here, what if I don't have a social security number? They're gonna click on that, and then they're gonna see a couple of different pop-ups. They want to be sure that only people who don't have a social security number go through these extra steps. Um, we don't want people who just can't remember their social security number to go through these extra steps, okay? This is only for people who truly do not know their social security number. Okay. Nikki, actually, I'm going to pause there because that's a point of um, lots of conversations here. Is there anything else that you want to add related to that piece? No, and I, I haven't had an experience yet with the attestation form, but I understand. Go, I mean, not, not really holding anyone up. So it's going, so you, I mean, okay. currently. So these families, again, I don't think we have huge numbers of them, but when we do, it is problematic. So just know that we're here to support those families. Just send them directly to us and, and we will we'll help them navigate that process. Yeah. Okay, so we kind of talked about, because I was thinking about which sequence should I do this in? We've talked about how to create an FSA ID. 
But let's talk now about who actually needs an FSA ID. Anybody can get one. I mean, we have people at FAME who have gone and gotten FSA IDs just so they can walk through the process. They have no intention of filing for financial aid. So anybody can get one, but who has to have one? So who has to have an FSA ID is determined by who is considered to be a contributor on the FAFSA. And so this is a new term that was created last year. So the, the strict definition of the contributor is the contributor is anyone who's providing information on the FAFSA. I'm going to move this up a little bit. Um, who is providing information on the FAFSA, who is required to provide consent by clicking approval, which allows the IRS to disclose federal tax information to the Department of Education to use in their federal tax information and disclose their federal tax information to schools and organizations. That's a mouthful. But what does this really mean? When someone goes ahead, let's say I'm the student, uh, because as it mentions in the next bullet, the student is always a contributor. Every single student has to click the box that says they consent to having their IRS information looked at and checked. And if there is IRS information on file for that particular year, having that transferred back into the FAFSA and then sent to the schools listed on their FAFSA, okay? So every single student has to do that. Anyone who is a contributor has to provide consent, even if they were non-tax filers. So if you've got a student that you're working with and they're 17 and they, they've been working side jobs, but they've never filed a tax return, you might think, well, they don't need to provide consent, do they? Yes, they do. Every single individual um, has to provide consent. So that's just a requirement, even if there is no tax information on file. We thought we might have more issues with people doing this. That actually went very smoothly last year. People just clicked through that process. It's a really long page of text, but they just clicked through and they provided their consent. So that actually went very smoothly. But that's who a contributor is. The definition is anyone who has to provide consent. So other possible contributors might be a parent or a parent's spouse or the student's spouse. And so we're gonna talk more about under what circumstances is someone beyond the student considered to be a contributor, meaning that they have to have their own FSA ID. So let's talk about parent contributors to start. If you have a scenario, you're working with a student and the student's parents are married to each other and for 2023, which is the tax year that's gonna be applicable for the FAFSA that's gonna open up on December 1st, the 25-26 FAFSA, if they filed a joint tax return, then what happens is information about both parents does have to be listed on the FAFSA, but actually only one parent is going to need to get an FSA ID and to log into the FAFSA and actually complete the parent section of the FAFSA. So if my kids were younger, this would be our scenario, okay? My husband and I are married. We file a joint tax return. So if I was still having to provide parent information on NOAA's FAFSA, um, I could be the only parent with an FSA ID. I could log in, provide my information, provide consent. Because we filed a joint tax return, I can authorize the release of his information as well. So he doesn't need to go in and do that separately. Now, I do have to provide his name and demographic information so that they can make sure that he is indeed the other person on the tax return, okay? So I do still have to provide some basic information about him, but he does not need to get an FSA ID and he doesn't need to sign into the FAFSA and do anything. I can do that all on his behalf. But what about if parents are married and they file separate tax returns? Because sometimes married couples do. Or what happens when parents live together, but they aren't married? In no situation, information for both parents is required on the FAFSA. And additionally, both parents will need their own FSA ID because both parents are going to have to log into the FAFSA and provide consent. So if my husband and I, for example, filed separate tax returns, I cannot grant consent for his tax information to be shared. He has to also sign in and do that. And Nikki, I think you had a point you wanted to make. Just thinking about those folks that don't file tax returns as well. Exactly. Good water break. Yeah, so people who, just like we said with students, if they don't file a tax return, they still have to provide consent. If we have parents, let's say we have parents and, you know, for, for you know, they're on some sort of other assistance and neither of them file taxes, both of them still have to get an FSA ID 
and they both still have to log into the FAFSA and provide consent, okay? So questions about that, let us know. Now, let's talk a little bit about parents who are divorced or separated um, or never married, and they don't live in the same household, okay? So there's a step before that you have to do first. So let's just say parents are divorced, biological or adoptive parents we're talking about. So the student's biological or adoptive parents are divorced from each other. The first thing you have to do is figure out which parent is going to be the parent on the FAFSA. And that is going to be, now with the definition that changed last year, it's going to be the parent that provided the most financial support in the last 12 months. So let's just say in this scenario, mom provided 60% of the financial support, dad provided 40%. Mom is going to be the parent on the FAFSA, and believe it or not, none of dad's information is needed on the FAFSA. CSS profile is different, but on the FAFSA, none of dad's information is required at all, okay? So mom is the parent on the FAFSA, but then there's one more step. If mom is remarried on the day the FAFSA is filed, even if she got married last week, then her spouse's information is going to be required on the FAFSA. And how do we determine whether the spouse needs to actually get their own FSA ID and sign into the FAFSA and provide consent? You got it. It comes back again to tax filing status for 2023. If mom and stepdad have been married for years and they file a joint tax return, you go back to the scenario we first talked about. Mom can go in and do the FAFSA. She can provide consent on behalf of both of them. Stepdad doesn't need to worry about it. But let's just say they got married recently. And so in 2023, they did not file a joint tax return. Then both mom and stepdad are going to need their own FSA IDs and they're going to have to go into the FAFSA and provide consent. It is the same, even though we're focusing on kind of on dependent students today, it is the same way that it works with an independent student. So if you had a, an independent student that you're working with and that student is married, then their spouse's information will be required on the FAFSA, but whether or not that spouse will have to sign in and provide consent comes down to what was on their 2023 tax return. If they file jointly, only the student needs to sign in um, and provide consent. If they didn't file jointly in 2023, then the spouse will need to get their own FSA ID and sign in, provide consent as well. Whew. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so FSA IDs should be created at least several days before the FAFSA um, is going to be filed. And the reason is, is because we've talked about this verification process. So when we create an FSA ID, we provide our social security number and our other identifying information, and that is verified or the term they use within the FAFSA is matched. So when you see that someone's FAFSA has matched, it means, means that their, ver their identity has been verified. Until that match has occurred, the student could file the FAFSA. They could log into their FAFSA. But guess what they can't do? They can't provide consent and they can't have their tax information pulled over from the IRS. So when Nikki and I were at events, we were trying to figure all this out last year. You know, we did everything we could to get people to create their FSA IDs ahead of time. That's why we're talking about this today. We want everyone who needs one to get this done sooner rather than later. But I'm gonna fast forward to December for a second. So if I'm in December and I'm in an event and I have a student who hasn't heard anything about this, can they create their FSA ID and use it that night? Yeah, they can, but they cannot provide consent and have their tax information pulled over, nor can the parents if they're in that situation. So the best case scenario is just to make sure that everyone gets their FSA ID created nice and early and verifies that it's matched. And how they can do that is they can go into studentaid.gov and under settings, they can look at their FSA ID information and see that it's matched. I didn't include a screenshot on that, but Nikki did a, a whole hour long session on FSA IDs. She and Florica did this summer, and that does live on our website and on YouTube. So if you wanna dig into that a little bit more, you can. And I wanted to cover a few other things today as well. So. Get people to understand who needs an FSA ID and get them created. We do have worksheets to help with that. Um, so basically, you're going to see that these look a little bit more basic than they did in the past. There is some additional information on the back of these two-page forms. 
But what we've decided to do is to keep the forms a lot more simple, but we've got a nice QR code that will take them to our website where they can learn a lot more about this process. But it is really important that people keep track of the information used when creating their FSA ID. And I say that because, as mentioned earlier, they are going to need to be able to have that FSA ID be working and that username and password known. Um, for years and years to come. Now they can reset passwords, they can retrieve usernames, they can do all of that, but it's like an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If right from the get-go, they make sure they know what this information is and they keep it up to date, that is going to make every part of the process a little bit easier. Um, not only do we have a form for students, we have a form for parents, and we also have one for those parents who don't have a social security number. So they can provide their information on the back is much more detail about what the next steps are in the process for them. Okay, so please use those forms. We'd love to have you there on our website. And we'd love to have you take advantage of those and distribute those to anyone and everyone. Last but not least in this FSA ID session section, excuse me, um, here's what studentaid.gov looks like. Um, you can see here that when you log in on a desktop, um, you're going to either log in if you've already created an FSA ID. If you haven't, you'll click on create account. Um, again, in Nikki's presentation from the summer, there's a lot more screenshots to show some of that. You can also do this on a phone. I'm not doing it on a phone. My eyes aren't good enough, but you can do all of this on a phone. It just looks a little bit different. So instead of saying log in and create, you're just going to click on the little person. Nikki, looks like we have a couple of questions. Yep. So uh, good questions. And I want to make sure we addressed it out loud. Um, does the system flag which parents have to get an FSA ID? No. Stop there because we've got the parent wizard that will ask the student, you know, which parent it, it asks a series of questions about your, you know, do your parents live together? Are they married? And that will kind of walk the student through who needs to get that FSA ID, who's going to be the contributor. Um, so the question is, when a newly married parent is sitting and doing the FAFSA, does a smart logic flag if a step parent has to get an FSA ID and give the permission? Yes. So um, I was thinking you were going a different direction. So yes, there are questions in the FAFSA that will help people identify which parents need that FSA ID. Um, like you've said, it's the parent wizard. It will walk through, it'll ask those series of questions and it will say, you know, both parents in that scenario, both parents need an FSA ID. What I thought you were gonna ask was a different question, which is what about in the case where parents are married and only one needs an FSA ID? Um, does it say this one has to or that one has to? In the case where only one parent needs an FSA ID, it can be either. So, so that's where I thought you were headed. But in a case where both parents need an FSA ID, they, the student is going to answer those series of questions and it's going to come up with, um, it's very interactive and it lets the students know that both students will need to, uh, both parents will need an FSA ID and will need to provide consent and log into the FAFSA, yes. So then the next follow-up question is, if parents were married in 2023, but yeah. divorced in 2024. Yes. Yep. Both parents, will both parents need an FSA ID since they were married in 2023? And I think that goes back to, are they still living together? Which yeah. is a very That's interesting right. question. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. So parents get divorced. And so parents, um, we're doing a FAFSA in December of 2023. Parents divorced last January. So the first question we've got to ask is, are they actually divorced or separated? Um, and if they are, are they still living under the same household? Because we know what sometimes what people do is they get divorced, but they still live in the same household. If they stay both still live in the same household, then both of them still have to provide information on the FAFSA. On the other hand, if they got divorced back in January and they just don't have anything to do with each other, um, then they first have to determine which parent is going to be the parent on the FAFSA. And that's going to be the parent who provided the most financial support in the last 12 months. So that's step one, identify which parent that is. And then that parent, when they go ahead and they complete the FAFSA, assuming they haven't remarried, we're not going to get that complicated, they're going to indicate that they're divorced. When they indicate that they're divorced, then only their information, because the FAFSA marital status is as of the day the FAFSA is being filed. So on the day in December 2023, that same mom is filling out the FAFSA, she's currently divorced, she's going to say my current marital status is divorced. 
So therefore, it only needs her information, completely only needs her information. Now, because she filed a joint tax return, her tax information will not pull over autom automatically. She still has to provide consent, but she's going to have to manually enter her tax information because the only information that will be used to determine eligibility for the student in that case is mom's information. Because the parents are divorced, only mom's information, financial information, will be the determining factor in the student's financial aid eligibility. Did I say that in a way that's clear, Nikki? Anything to add? No, I think that that makes sense. And Those I'll, put, I'll put some notes in the... Okay. I got you, Lisa. I'm going to put a little, uh, just a follow-up note in the chat. Go ahead. Okay. Great. No, that's a great question. It's these scenarios that we, you know, we, we always want to talk about, and sometimes we hesitate to go down the path too, too much in our initial presentation uh, because we don't want it to be too overwhelming. Um, but at the same time, this is where we spend our time. So these are the emails that Nikki and I get and, and the rest of the team. So anytime you have a situation that doesn't fit neatly into a box, um, please reach out to us and ask about that. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk a little bit about um, the schools on the FAFSA. So a student needs to list at least one school on the FAFSA, but they should list every single school that they're even considering. So even if they haven't done any um, admissions applications, even if they have no idea where they might be going, a student can now list up to 20 schools on the FAFSA. So they wanna list every school that they're even thinking about. What we want students and families to be doing this fall, ideally, is to start to use net price calculators, which live on the school's website. Each individual school is required to have a net price calculator to get a sense of, okay, we're putting this school on this list of schools that the student might apply to. We're gonna put the school on the FAFSA, but sooner rather than later, we'd love to have families getting a sense of the affordability of a variety of schools. Because here's what we want at the end of the day. We want students to have a list of schools that meet their needs academically, geographically, size-wise, they're a good fit, but we also want to be sure there are some schools that are truly going to be affordable for that student. Um, so we want to have more than two schools. I had a student this year who applied to two out-of-state schools, private schools, neither of them were affordable. You know, and in retrospect, like why, you know, wish she had applied to a school in Maine that would have been more affordable. So we just want to be sure that that list of schools is comprehensive and is taking into account affordability. Um, we know the focus is often on, you know, the majors and all of that. All that stuff is super important, but so is affordability. So a net price calculator can help give a sense of how affordable a school may be. It uses the family's specific information, the school specific information, and gives an estimate of what the student might be eligible to receive. But do watch for signs that these haven't been updated. Um, we are concerned with the, what the year looked like last year with the FAFSA, that financial aid offices were completely overwhelmed with so many tasks and so many challenges that net price calculators might not be up to date. So if they still refer to the EFC, the expected family contribution that's replaced, been replaced by the student aid index or the SAI. If you're still seeing EFC, it's an indication that that probably hasn't been updated. Students can also use the Big Future website to investigate and search for schools based on affordability. Um, schools range, as you all know, tremendously in the amount of financial aid that they offer and the percent of need that they meet. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's just say we've got a situation where the student files their FAFSA and they have a $10,000 SAI. If they're looking at school A and school A costs 50,000, then what that school does is says, okay, we're 50,000. Looks like you know, your SAI is 10,000. We're gonna subtract that 10,000 from 50,000. You've got $40,000 in need. If they can fill all of that, they're gonna meet 100% of need. They're gonna provide um, $40,000 in financial aid. Okay. Another school might say, hey, we're 25,000. You still got to contribute your 10, at least on paper. You've got 15,000 in need. If that school provides 15,000, they're meeting 100% of need. But what we're finding is the vast majority of schools cannot meet 100% of need. Some schools do. There are many schools that provide 80, maybe 90% of need or fill that. But there are lots of schools out there that only are filling 50 and 60%. What we don't want is a student to have a list of schools that are all only filling 50 or 60%. We know that we need to wait for the student to get their financial aid offer to know what their actual aid package is looking like, 
But in anticipation of that, we want them to do the research to increase the likelihood that they are putting schools on their list, at least some that are going to be more affordable. So what the Big Future website allows people to do is to go here and you can see all of the different criteria. It's about 4,000 schools in here. They can use this criteria to have those schools narrowed down to have find the schools that meet their specific criteria. So they might major, location, size of the school, but one of these is affordability. So you'll see that affordability box. And so as part of searching for a school using the other criteria, we would love to see people also include affordability in that criteria. So, you know, maybe searching for schools that only meet 100% need isn't going to provide a, a, lot, a large list of schools. But hey, what I would always say to my kids is at least start with schools that meet 90%. Let's try to find those schools that at least on average seem to provide pretty good financial aid and meet a significant portion of their students' needs. It's just a piece of, of information to consider when students are building their list of schools. Okay, so they're building their list of schools. So that's something we'd love to have them doing this fall. Another thing that we'd love to have happen this fall is if you're willing um, to share this resource with them. This is our Path to Affording Higher Education handout. We've had it for a couple of years now, and we've got a couple of different pieces of information that I want to call attention to. First of all, we have this piecemeal approach. So this is something we talk about all the time. Most students are not going to get enough financial aid that is going to cover everything. Most students, their families don't have enough saved to cover everything. What's a much more effective way of paying for higher education, and Nikki and I have been through this ourselves, is to use that piecemeal approach. So imagine a piece of pie. So I love pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. I might want to cut that pie into two pieces. That's great for my pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving. But when it comes to financial aid, if I'm solely relying on need-based aid and my savings, those have to be pretty substantial. If instead I cut that pie into six pieces, no one piece has to be as large and it's gonna make paying for higher education easier. So I'm thinking about savings, you know, not full savings, but just some savings. I'm thinking about tuition payment plans. I'm thinking about need-based aid. I'm thinking about merit-based aid. I'm thinking about maybe some federal student loans. I'm thinking about all of those different things. You know, there are even tax credits. So this piecemeal approach is something we'd like people to start thinking about sooner rather than later. Additionally, you can see our pathway, some of the stuff we're talking about today, you know, building that list of schools. And then of course, comparing those financial aid offers uh, if only everyone before they sent that deposit into a school and made a decision as to where they're going, compared those offers and made sure that they understood. I'm not saying they have to pick the most, uh, or the, the least expensive school. In some cases, I would say that's not the best thing to do, but I want them to at least know how affordable one school is versus the other um, and put that in the mix along with the school being a good fit. And then on the back of this, we have our conversation starters. And we just think that when families have conversations about expectations, sooner rather than later, that's a really good thing. Um, this came from a variety of places, but one of which was my oldest son, who's going to be 30 this year, I don't know how, um, used to go with me when I started working at FAME and I'd go to these financial aid nights and he would be in the car with me and we'd talk about this. Long before spring of his senior year, we had had the conversation about how much we could afford to contribute. So as he started getting those financial aid offers back and he saw how much was left and how much we'd have to contribute, there were some schools that he knew went right off the list. And then there were other schools that he knew fell into that list that we, we could look at and we could work with. Um, but we talked about it long before he ever put schools on his list. So we would just love families to have a conversation about expectations. Are students gonna be required to apply for scholarships? How many? Who's responsible for what? It just makes the whole process a lot easier when these conversations start earlier rather than later. As you know, um, so many of you, when you get to spring of senior year, emotions are sky high and people are not always as rational as they might have been um, a year earlier in the process. I think you're all familiar with our pay publication. Um, we would love to have you distribute this widely um, among your students. It has basic information, but it, it includes things like, you know, that tracking sheet. Um, it has the checklist. It just has a lot of great resources. We hope, we think, if you need more resources, let us know. 
um, but um, our partners received a mailing um, at the end of August. Um, so if you received a mailing, that's great. We hope that you did. If you didn't, um, or if you received the mailing and want more of particular pieces of materials, just go to our publications page, famemain.com slash publications, and you can order as many materials as you would like um, and everything we do on the education side of the house um, in terms of our outreach and our materials is, is all free. So please take advantage of that. We also have this get ready to file uh, the 2526 the 2526 FAFSA. Um, this is on our website as well. We'd love to have you distribute this. Uh, this is chock a block full of resources, all in one two page document. It talks about FSA ID creation. It talks about what's needed to file the FAFSA. It talks about assets and which assets are required and which ones aren't. So for example, primary residence is not an asset on the FAFSA. Retirement accounts are not an asset on the FAFSA, so it breaks those down. It also provides information on who needs to provide parent information. So not parent information isn't always required. So when is it required? And then if it is required, who are the parents? Some of the stuff we've talked about today, these are resources that you can use with your student to kind of walk through their individual scenarios. So in the last couple of moments, just checking my time here. What I want to um, do is just talk about students who have really challenging circumstances so that as these students come to you, you know how to advise them. Because the good news is that the, the FAFSA is not a person, but the FAFSA is aware, <laughs> or people who create the FAFSA are aware that there are many students out there who have really challenging circumstances, and many of those have been built into the FAFSA. So for example, if a student can answer yes to any one of these questions, they are going to automatically be considered independent, meaning they don't have to provide parent information on the FAFSA. So basically, if they're 24, if they're married, if they're a graduate student, if they're in the military or been honorably discharged, um, if they have children or others that they financially support, but then there are these ones that I think are the ones that you might run into the most. If you, for example, have a high school student or any student who that at any time since turning 13, um, they were in foster care, they're automatically considered independent. If you're working with a student who someone other than their biological parents have legal guardianship, Court, court legal guardianship, like their grandparents, they're automatically independent. If you have a student who's emancipated, an emancipated minor, they're automatically independent. If you have a student who is homeless or at risk of being homeless, they are going to be considered independent. One extra step, but they're going to be considered independent. So for those students who you know who are in these situations, will you please let them know the FAFSA is actually going to be super easy for them to complete because they're going to answer yes to these questions and be independent. I'm just sharing the screenshots of the questions that we just talked about. They flow across a couple of different screens, but it can they, they indicate they're married or they're in a graduate program or they can say yes to any of these automatically considered independent. Now, if a student is homeless or risk, at risk of being homeless, it's slightly different. So let's say you have a student that you're working with and they are homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless. Now, mind you, we don't have screenshots for the 25-26 FAFSA yet. This is the 24-25 FAFSA, but for the upcoming year, it will be at any time, not currently, at any time on or after for the upcoming FAFSA, it will be July 1st of 2024, was the student unaccompanied and either homeless or self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? If the student can answer yes to that question, they are going to see a screen that basically says, um, can anyone document this, okay? So if a student, and this is probably the case with a lot of your students, Set, looks through the list and they say, yes, yes, uh, my, my high school liaison um, can document that I'm homeless or someone from an emergency shelter, or I work with Giro and Giro, I work with Trio and Gear Up and they can document that. Or I've already worked with a financial aid administrator and they can document. If a student says, yes, I'm in that scenario and yes, one of these individuals can document that, they are automatically considered independent. No additional action is needed. But let's just say no one can document it. None of these identifying organizations can document it. Then the student will say none of these, and they are going to be considered what we call provisionally independent, 
meaning they're going to be considered independent. They don't have to provide parent information on the FAFSA, but they will have to follow up with the financial aid office and um, provide, you know, either have a conversation that that should be sufficient in many cases uh, or a little bit more. OK, if you have students navigating that process, please have them reach to, out to us. We'd be happy to work, work, work with them through that. And then one last scenario, what if none of those things apply, but the student cannot provide parent information on the FAFSA? Then that might be a student who has unusual circumstances. That's a defined term in federal student aid. So just uh, unusual circumstances are things like the student has left home because it's dangerous for them. It's a threatening environment. Maybe there's drug abuse. Maybe there's all sorts of physical or emotional abuse happening in the home. It's not safe for the student to be there. Maybe their parents, or uh, they don't know where their parents are. Maybe their parents are incarcerated. So here are some examples of what unusual circumstances are. If a student says, yes, you know, I left home because it wasn't safe for me to be there, they would then say yes to this. They too would be considered provisionally independent, meaning they can finish the FAFSA, no parent information, but they will need to work with the colleges that they're attending, and if they've applied to multiple schools, then they need to work with each of those schools um, to provide documentation regarding their situation. I know I went through that last section a little bit quickly, um, but please feel free to reach out to us. We just want you to know that there is a pathway for those students with difficult circumstances, and we're here to support them um, in any way that we can, and we know that you are too. So whether you reach out to us or they reach out to us, either scenario works for us. So we're here for you, we're here for your students. Um, you know, in addition to you know, webinars like this, uh, we want you to know that we're holding financial aid information sessions. We have both in-person and virtual sessions. We have those listed on our events page. So please encourage students and families to attend or caregivers to attend one of those. Uh, we want people to sign up to get texts and emails from us. Um, and to do that, they just go to our, our join page, famemaine.com slash join to incentivize that because it's really important, I think we think, for them to do that. Anyone who's in the class of 2025, whether it be the student or their parent or guardian, or both can do this or all of them can do this, um, they will be entered into a drawing for one of three $1,000 future uh, fund scholarships. So if you've got a student and they want to sign up for text and their parents want to sign up for emails, or they both want to sign up for both texts and emails, they can do all of that. And each time they do that, you know, they can't keep duplicating signing up multiple times themselves for the same thing. But each time they sign up for a text, each time they sign up, uh, if the student signs up for a text and an email, they will be entered twice, basically. OK, so please spread that word and encourage um, students and parents and caregivers to do that. We also have our Facebook group. Last year, we found that this was one of the best places for us to share information about what we were learning about the FAFSA. We now have almost 900 members in this group. So we have parents who have been through it. So we'd love to have um, you and your other parents and caregivers uh, that you're aware of join our Facebook group. And we do offer one-on-one -on -one uh, financial aid coaching. Um, if individuals want to schedule an appointment, um, they can go to famemaine.com slash contact. And there um, we will meet with them one-on-one -on -one via Zoom. We have appointments all throughout the year. So it's not just certain times of the year. We have appointments all throughout the year. And we will talk with them about anything, including planning, doing the FAFSA, comparing financial aid offers, figuring out how to pay the rest of the bill, all of that, anything they wanna talk about, we are willing and able to do. And in closing, I just want to let you know that we have our Wednesday webinars on the second Wednesday of every month. October's webinar will be all about scholarships. So you can see the definition or the description, um, but if you would like to sign up, you can go to famemaine.com slash events. We send out the invite two weeks before. Um, so you will get uh, an invite if you're on our list, uh, but if you're not, please let me know that and I'll get you on our list. Uh, but you can always also go directly to our events page and register for our webinar and other events there. All right. I was a little speedy at the end. I do recognize that. Sorry. Nikki, um, do we have any questions that before I stop the recording you would like to bring up and have us address? No, I think we are good other than the net price calculators. Some of them Use some schools use the free net price calculator offered by the Department of Education. Just wanted to mention that 
that uses really old information. Yeah. So when we look at those ones that are using the, the free site, it's um, 2223 estimated aid. Um, so just, just something to be aware of. And honestly, like schools are required to have the net price calculator, but my God, our people in financial aid offices have been so busy that I think the net price calculator is one of those things that's probably last on the list to get updated. So it is great to do an estimate, see what it looks like, but just be aware. Um, will the 2526 FAFSA offer a renewal? Like, will they bring forward information? Great question. You know, I always hate to answer a question that I don't know the answer for <laughs> sure, but I don't know the answer for sure, but I'll, I'll share what I think. Is crystal ball. Yeah, crystal ball. Um, the reality is now is that there's the information that comes over from the FSA ID. So certainly that that comes over and that pre-populates a little bit of information. My understanding, and I saw that Randy asked this question, so Randy knows the FAFSA inside and out. One of the things that they changed in the legislation is that before, if you answered, this is going to seem like I'm not answering this question, but bear with me. If you answered yes to one of the things that made a student independent, you didn't see the other questions. When they changed the legislation, they required that each of those questions still be asked, even if a student answered yes to one of them that would have made them independent. Why I think this is connected is that I do not think that there's going to be a lot of information that is going to come over. I don't, I haven't heard nothing about a renewal, um, but I'm not sure. But I just think that the, they changed the regulations in a way that I think those questions have to be asked each individual year. Now, there aren't that many questions anymore. And one of the things I did want to add is I did know his FAFSA, I did it for him, even though he's independent. And as an independent student, now granted, I didn't read through the questions closely because I was familiar with them. It took me four minutes, you guys. It took me four minutes to do his FAFSA. Um, so the reality is, is there aren't all that many questions, but I have heard nothing about renewals and carryover of information. Uh, along the same vein, I just was, that got me thinking about parents who have multiple students that they need to do FAFSA yeah. school. Yeah, we did talk if, about that. Yeah. So parents who have multiple students, I thought I heard at one point in time that there was, because the parent's information is tied to them and is tied to their FSA ID, that there would be a process that made it a little bit simpler um, when there are multiple kids. I don't know that I saw that the way that I thought I was going to this past year, Nikki. So this is one of those things where we don't know if what we saw last year is exactly how it will look this year. We do know that they are making as few changes as possible, that the goal was to, to really limit the changes and to only make challenges changes to the things that were challenging, like that darn unsub question. We've heard that that's being reworked and some other things are being tweaked to make it a better experience. So I don't know. I'm not sure with parents of multiple kids how that's going to work going forward. So stay tuned. Um, you know, we will learn right along with you and we will share that as, as we know more. Um, the question about the organizations uh, that will be working with um, students in that first beta set, um, that was released literally, I saw that a half an hour before. So I think Federal Student Aid just put that out today. Alabama Possible is one of them. That's the only one off the top of my head I remember. Um, so yeah, I think there were six organizations, uh, but that was released by Federal Student Aid today, Jen. So I think um, in the announcements, I, I get the daily the daily updates, I think it will be included in that. But I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna send it to you um, when I get off this webinar. I am going to stop recording. So thank you for everyone um, for being here. Uh, let's see.